Um, I put on the web page two data sets. Um, uh, one is for the COVID data from CMO. Uh, the other one is a much larger data set. Uh, it's a data set on morphological measurements from lizards. Uh, from desert lizards, essentially. Uh, and uh, the reason for these two data sets is because there are a couple of uh, procedures that we want to explore. Um, the first of those is, um, is time series. Boy, I don't like that marker at all. Uh, the first of those is time series. Um, and the other one is principal components. I don't like that one for either. Um, now the, the thing about time series, um, time series are actually uh, incredibly important and incredibly valuable. Um, Oh, I do have a third data set up on the web page, and that's uh, the closing Dow Jones Industrial Average closings um, since 1883 or something like that. It goes all the way up to, I think, uh, the, the day before the election or something of that sort. Uh, the reason time series stuff is so important is because economists do that sort of work all the time. Uh, they do a lot of forecasting work. Um, if you pay attention to the stock market, uh, well, I, I recognize that most of you are probably not in a position where you're very concerned with the stock market or you're not very concerned with investments or any of that sort of stuff. It's hard when you're broke to pay much attention to that sort of stuff. Um, but at some point in your life, you are going to be making regular money and uh, and it'll be important to understand what to do with your money. Um, it's possible to live paycheck to paycheck and spend everything you make. And when you retire, everything that you're going to base your retirement on is Social Security, or if you're lucky, maybe your employer has a pension or something. But pensions are going away. Even here at CMO, the pension that they offer now is pathetic compared to what it was when I started, which is lucky for me, but not so lucky for the new faculty, right? So what happens in a time series analysis is you're trying to uh, take into account the fact that observations are related to one another. So if you think about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, whatever it closes at today is not independent of where it closed yesterday. It's related. The same is true for COVID-19. The number of COVID cases that we have on the CMO campus today is not independent of how many we had yesterday. So we need to somehow take that into account. And there are a couple of ways to do that. The easiest way to do it is when you build your regression model, uh, we're going to have y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x right, plus epsilon, we recognize that these error terms are correlated with one another, okay? So those residuals are related somehow to the value from the previous day and or to the value from the day before that. So let's think about that, for example, if we look at time on this axis, and the number of COVID cases on campus, it's doing something like that, okay? If we were to put a straight line through that, well, here we're deviating above the line, and that's related to the previous day and the next day and all of that. So the easiest way to do this is say, okay, there is a correlation between the value today and the value from the previous day. And in fact, if you look at the data that are on the web page, 
and you plot the data, just number of COVID, cumulative COVID cases by day, what you'll discover is that the data come in peaks. And the peaks are about seven days long. So there's roughly seven days between each peak. I wonder why the hell that is. Well, there are two things going on. One is that the incubation period for COVID-19 is about 14 days. It's about two weeks. And secondly, it's weekend. Go out and party, drink some beers, socialize with your buddies, hook up with your friends, spread some COVID around. Okay? So every seven days you get that peak. So in other words, if we were to look at what are referred to as the autocorrelations, the correlations of these other terms, with, instead of calling them epsilons, we could call them t's, we can look at the correlations between those, and what we'll discover is the correlation between today's number of cases and the cases seven days ago is going to be high. And the correlation between tomorrow's cases and the number of cases seven days back is going to be high. Five days back, not so high. Four days back, not so high. Three days back, not so high. Two days back, maybe a little bit higher. One day back, maybe a little bit higher. But you're going to find these very specific patterns. Doing that sort of analysis in R is not trivial. Okay? And the reason for that is because there are all these different ways to approach it. The most common way to approach it is um, what's called ARMA, okay? which stands for autoregression with a moving average. Okay? And I'm I've developed the code for you to work through on that, but I'm not yet ready to present it to you. It's going to take me at least an hour to work through all of that, so I'm going to hold off on that. But the data set is there, and if you want, you can begin playing with it. Treat it as a simple regression problem. So what I'm asking you to do is pull down that COVID data Use the R code that you have up to this point and try a series of different regression models. So try a linear. So you're going to regress cumulative COVID cases against day. Do it linear. Do it polynomial. So do a second order polynomial, a third order polynomial, and a fourth order polynomial. So a second order you're going to have y, where y is the number of COVID cases, is equal to beta 0, plus beta 1 times x, which is day, plus beta 2 times x squared, that would be the second, the second order, plus beta 3 x cubed plus beta 4 x to the fourth. Okay? So that's the first thing. You're going to go ahead and do that, and then I will come back in a week or so, and we will talk about how then to improve the quality of that model, right, by taking into account autocorrelation. And what you'll discover is that the fit actually improves better, improves much more, and the bias in the model is going to become much less. So that's on the horizon. That assignment will not be due for a while yet. Okay? But that's coming down the pipe. The next thing that I want you to do as a homework assignment, also with respect to regression, is this. On the data, on, on the web page, there is the data set for the Dow Jones Industrial Average closes. What I want you to do is to pick two presidents, sequential, okay? So you might look at Bush versus Obama, or you might look at Obama versus Trump, or you might look at Reagan versus um, 
H.W. Bush. Or you might look at Reagan Bush versus, versus um, Clinton or something like that. In other words, I just want you to compare two sequential administrations. And then I want you to do the spline. And we, we talked about doing splines. If you look on the, the page, it's going to give a date, which is some kind of a format, 10, 21, 1993, or something like that. A day, uh, which if it isn't in there, I would suggest that you put that in. I think I have put sort of a numerical um, day in there, a Julian date, or something like that. And then the close. So. Presidents always change on, I think it's always on January 20th, is it not? I think it's always think on, that's pardon? Inauguration day. Yeah. I think Inauguration Day is it. So we'll say, for example, Joe Biden's uh, presidency is going to start on January 20th, 2021, even though he was elected in 2020. His term doesn't start until 2021. So find your president and figure out the days for president one and then president two and pay attention to what that day number is because that's what you need when you compute your spline. So go back to the notes and the question that I'm going to ask you to do, and we'll do this in a couple of stages, the first question I want you to ask is, is the spline significant? So you're going to do a straight linear regression and ask the question, is the spline different? So you're not even going to worry about a polynomial or anything of that sort, just a straight linear regression. You have the spline and you're going to ask, is it significant? After we've done that, we're going to go back with the autocorrelation in a week or two and then ask the question, all right, now is it still significant after we remove the autocorrelated terms? And it turns out the autocorrelation, I think, for the Dow Jones goes back about three or four weeks. So by the time you're four weeks out, the error terms are, the autocorrelation amongst the error terms is zero. In other words, the close of the Dow today is roughly uncorrelated with the close a month from now. All right, so that's coming down the pike. One word of caution when you're looking at a data set that is this large and you run it depending on how powerful your computer is, is it can take some time. I was running some of these models in R last night um, and I would hit the, you know, hit enter and it just sits there and it waits, you know, and you go back, get a cup of coffee, have a couple of pieces of pizza, drink a beer, come back down and suddenly finally it, it shows up, okay? So some of these, it's going to be a little bit time consuming. All right, good. So that's coming down the pike. Uh, what I want to do today, which is much easier, is I want to talk about principal components analysis. Um, oftentimes referred to as PCA. Principal components analysis is an ordination routine. It is not a statistical test. Okay? Not a statistical test. It's simply where it's what scientists do best. We wash bottles and we sort buttons. Okay? So it's a bottle washing, button sorting technique. There is, principal components analysis is a special case of factor analysis. Factor analysis is a statistical test. Psychologists, sociologists, do a lot of work with factor analysis, okay? It is a statistical test. We're not doing that. We're using it for a very simple reason. It is easy to do principal components analysis in R. Unfortunately, 
it's easy, I shouldn't say unfortunately, there is an easier way to do it, and that's what I'm going to show you. Now, doing a principal components analysis by hand is not that difficult. Well, yeah, it is, depending on how big your data set is. Mathematically, it's not difficult because all you're doing is you're solving the characteristic equation. So if you can invert a matrix, right, if you can take the determinant of a matrix and solve the characteristic equation, you can get everything you need from the principal components analysis, and that's what R is doing. Logically, here's what's happening. Let's imagine we have a simple two-dimensional data set. We might have height and weight. So we go out and we randomly select a thousand citizens from Cape Girardeau. And we measure how tall each person is, and we record their body weight, and that's all. So on this axis, we have height, and on this axis, we have weight. And here on this graph, we're going to do the scatter diagram of height and weight. And you know that people that are taller are heavier than people that are shorter. But you also know that two people that are the same height might have very different body weights. So two people with the same height, there's one person here who is low weight and another person up here who is high weight. But still, there is this relationship between height and weight. All we're doing in principal components analysis is changing our point of view. We're going to take this coordinate system and we're going to shift it. We're going to move this point right here to this point right here. To the middle of that ellipse of data points. And then we're going to take our axes and we're going to rotate them. And the way we rotate them is by doing the reduced, well, it's by solving the characteristic equation. But you can think of it as just computing the reduced major axis regression. So all we're going to do is take this coordinate system and rotate it like that. The two axes are still perpendicular. We no longer call this axis, well, we now call this axis PC1. This is an eigenvector. This is an eigenvector. This is going to be PC2. Notice what's happening along PC1. PC1 has most of the variation in the data. PC2 has less. If we had three variables, height, weight, waist, or shoe size, PC3. then we'd have PC3. And the best part of all of this is the following. PC2 is perpendicular to PC1. In a statistical terms, we say that PC2 is orthogonal to PC1. What I mean is they are statistically independent. And what I mean by that is no matter where you are on PC1, it tells you absolutely nothing about where you are on PC2. Notice, I've not done anything to the numbers themselves. This point is in exactly the same place it's always been. That point hasn't moved. What's changed is where I'm standing when I'm looking at the point. That's all. So all of the distances between points that were there originally are still there. Nothing has changed. Just our point of view. PC1 is equal to alpha times height plus alpha 1 times height plus alpha 2 times weight. So each principal component is a linear combination of the original variables. 
And the stronger the correlation between that axis and height or that axis and weight is going to be reflected in those alpha ones and alpha twos. The alphas are referred to as coefficients. They're kind of like a correlation. Sometimes we refer to them as loadings. And if you were doing factor analysis, they would be factor loadings. Why do we want to do this? I'll, I will give you a practical example in just a few moments. But here's the real reason for doing factor or for doing principal components analysis. Number one. Let's imagine you wanted to compare heights and weights using t-tests of some sample of people. Maybe you've divided people into <coughs> men and women, or between people on the south side of town and people on the north side of town, or people that like to fish versus people that like to gamble. Okay, whatever it happens to be. So you do the t-test and you compare their heights, but now because you live in a Bayesian world, you have to use a Bonaparte adjustment before you can compare them on the weights because they're not statistically independent. But if you do the principal components analysis, you can say, okay, I want to compare their scores on PC1 using a t-test. You can do it. And then you can compare the scores on PC2 and it's independent, no Bonfrati adjustment required. In other words, you can do more tests. Well, what does the test mean? Easy, PC1 means height to that degree and weight to that degree. So they are both linear combinations of height and weight. But I will guarantee you that one axis is gonna emphasize one, the other axis will emphasize the other. The question is, how big should that alpha be before you say it's meaningful or it's not? And there is this very simple rule of thumb for making that determination. If you have if you have two variables, it's one over the square root of two. If you have three variables, it's one or the square root of three. So one divided by one point, what's the square root of two? 1.4, roughly. So pull out our little calculator, get my magic phone out. There we go. Close down the Audubon Bird app. Somewhere on this thing I've got a calculator. Ah, there it is. There's my calculator. Pull that up. Square root of 2 is 1.4. And I want to take the inverse of that. So 1 divided by 1.4. That's 0.71. So if the value of alpha is greater than 0.71, I say that that is important. Okay? Let's do an example. All right. So the first thing you're going to have to do First thing I'm going to have to do is turn on the video so you can see what the heck is going on. Always the dodgy deal. Unless this thing has a manual switch. Ah, there we go. I think. Uh, I'm going to ask you to download a program, another software program. The program is called PAST. Have we talked about PAST before? No. 
PAS stands for Paleontology and Stratigraphy. It is a software package developed out of Helsinki, the University of Helsinki, Finland. There we go. Okay, so let's get that out of there. Let's go to the Google. Okay, so now go to Google, there we go. So I want past. I'm going to type in program past. All capitals, I'm downloading. Okay, the first, unfortunately, the University in Helsinki, they have this biodiversity um, and paleontology program, which is just unbelievable. I mean, they're so incredibly productive. They have all these free software programs and they cycle through them. They're, not, they're no longer supporting, put, putting a link to this program there. But you can go to this web page right here, pass.enlo4d.com, and it is available there. I've downloaded it numerous times from that website. It's safe, it's all good. And past 4.03, scroll down all the way to the bottom. Download past 4.03 for Windows. And here you get a choice of, of uh, mirror sites. I want the one out of the US. Past in four seconds, three, two, one, zero, download is starting. And here is the zip program down at the bottom. I do not want to, okay, we'll recommend them on Facebook, fine. Close that. Okay, get out of there. Close that. Okay, so let's open up zip, the program there, opening in 12 seconds, 11, 10, Three, two, one, zero. Okay, here it is over on this side. Okay, so this is a zip file. So I'm going to click on it and then click extract. Extract all. And that's opening up over here. So we're going to put it, that's fine. We'll just extract it right there. Uh, how about if we just um, put it under programs? Program files. What's the other program file right below that? Okay, select folder and extract. All right, we'll put it somewhere else. Um, we'll put it under downloads. How's that? Now I'm lost. Extract all. Okay, downloads, extract. There we go. There, there's, there's our program, okay? All right, so now uh, let's go to um, the Sobrinus page and get that lizard morphology data set. Okay, courses. the Dow Jones Industrial Average data, okay, on week 11 material. Um, there's the COVID data. Here's the lizard morphology data. Let's load that, okay. It's as a CSV file, 
and I'm going to move that over here like this so that you can see it. And I'm going to I'll show that again. Okay, so there's the data set. Okay. Um, So what I have is I have species, well I have Australia, I have species, snout bend length, jaw length, and so on. I have Australian desert lizards, um, I've got African desert lizards, North American desert lizards, okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, reduce the size of the data set, I'm going to delete everything but the North American lizards for now for for the example that we're doing here in class so let me highlight all those things I'll delete Australia and Africa the reason Australia and Africa are cool is because there are lots of legless lizards in Australia and Africa and it turns out that a lot of them are intermite specialists Okay, so delete, there we go. And now, because everything is North American, I can delete that column, delete, great. Okay, so here's my data set. I'm going to click on that very first one there, scroll down to the bottom. Oops. So it's 1,170 observations, and control C, so I'm copying all of that. Now I'm going to paste it into past. All right, uh, now though what I want to do is I want to label these variables, so I'm going to click the column attributes button right there, and I'm going to name all of these variables here. And the first one, is species, okay, and I'm going to go up here and indicate what kind of variable it is. It is a group variable. So now I'm going to go over here to my other observations and put those in here. All right, let's see if I can. this over the side. What I'll do is I'll get fancy and just do this sort of thing. Did you start to call one A and past before when you pasted it over? Yeah, I did. Uh, what just happened? Did I just Yeah, so one A yeah, in A one. Okay. All right, so now the next one is SVL, which stands for snout vent length, then jaw length, um, jaw width, jaw height, uh, front upper leg, front lower leg, um, front foot. Um, digit four on the front foot, uh, rear upper leg, rear lower leg, um, rear foot, digit four on the rear foot, um, and then body width. Okay, great. Let me minimize that. And uh, now there's our data set, and I can now unclick the column attributes. So now, doing the principal components analysis is easy peasy. Okay? All I'm going to do is, I think I have to select the data that I wanted to use, so I'm going to click on that column A1, and then scroll over here to the bottom. That should be my last observation. Hit shift and click. And now I've highlighted all of the data. 
And now I'm going to go up to multivariate. You see the multivariate tab at the top? I'm going to click on multivariate, and I'm going to drop down to ordination. And I'm going to go over here to where it says principal components analysis. And click on that. And there, whammo, bammo. I've got it. Let me, this is part of the, of, of, uh, what we want to look at. Here's the cool thing. So I had how many variables? I think I had, well, I had 13 variables. Okay? So I get 13 principal components. The number of variables you're going to get, the number of principal components you're going to get is absolutely equal to the number of variables. The first principal component contains 81.89% of the variation in the data. If you think about variance as information, 80, more than 80% of the information in the data is contained in that first principal component. Almost 10% in the second principal component. 6% in the third. And from there on out, it gets less than 1%, okay? We can look at that on something called a scree plot. So let's look at the scree plot. And there you have it. This is the principal component, and this is the percentage of variance explained. 80%, 10%, 6%, 6%. And then almost nothing. So we're taking this data set which has 13 dimensions and reducing it down to one or two or three dimensions. And it's much easier to think in terms of three-dimensional space than in 13-dimensional space. So we've just simplified our lives. And the first principal component is statistically independent of the second statistically independent of the third, and so on. Well, what is the first principal component? Well, let's look at, well, first let's look at the scatter plot. So now, let's look at principal component one versus principal component two. So there are all the data points. Here's PC12, whoops, PC1, and then PC2, and each dot is another observation in our data set. Let me make that bigger to spread it out a little bit more. Okay, so I see that something, man, there are some points which are way there. Well, there's sort of an interesting group right down there. So this is PC1, that's PC2. Here's the fun thing, the nice thing about this particular program I can put 95% ellipses in here to surround each species. So each dot belongs to a different species. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to click on 95% ellipses, and there they are. Well, would you look at that? All those species right down there are off by themselves. Who are those species? It turns out that these guys down here are all in the genus Phrynosoma. Those are the horned toads. And horned toads are the lizards that are shaped like pancakes with short little stubby legs and all these horns on top of their bodies. They're obviously very different from everybody else. Okay? Well, the other thing that we can do is we can look at a bot, what's referred to as a biplot. Oh, well, we could look at PC2 versus PC3. So we could look at PC11 versus PC13, whatever we want, right? But in terms of writing a paper, all the information is PC1, 2, and 3. So we could do PC1 versus 2, PC1 versus 3, PC2 versus PC3, whatever, whatever is interesting. Okay, so let's go back to PC... 1 versus PC2. There we go. I'm going to get rid of the ellipses. And now what I want to do is something called a biplot. 
and I'm going to just to make it more legible, I'm going to change the scale to the eigen to the eigenvalue scale. And now you can see each of these represents the correlation between that raw variable and these axes. So that's body width. So animals that are wide-bodied are down here. Animals that are narrow-bodied are up here. Animals that are long are out in this direction. Animals that are short are in that direction. Animals that have long fourth digits on their rear feet and longer feet are up here. Nanos with short rear feet and short toes on the rear feet are down here. And suddenly, if you understand, if you know anything about lizards, this makes perfect sense. Because what's important to a lizard? Temperature and mode of locomotion. That's what matters to a lizard. And what matters in terms of temperature is what kind of a forager are you? Are you sit and wait? Or are you actively foraging? Lizards that are actively foraging have long skinny bodies, long back legs, long rear feet, and long fourth toes. Lizards that sit and wait are things like horn toes that have pancake-shaped bodies, short little stubby legs, and they sit there and wait for the ants to come to them. And that's what they eat. They eat ants. The cool thing that they do is they find a column of harvester ants. And they park their little butts right in front, and they open their mouth, and the harvester ants, as you know, follow those pheromone trails, and the first ant walks into his mouth, and he swallows, and the next ant picks up on the pear and walks, and he just keeps swallowing. He's standing there and he get, until his belly is full. And the cool thing is that the reason they have that pancake-shaped body is so that they can get really hot in the sun get the body temperature way the heck up so that they can process all that formic acid. Yeah. All right. So, and notice, you can, you can take this graph and you can copy it and you can save it and you can turn it into a publication quality figure. Now, let's look at the scores we had a value here for the snout vent length and all that. So these are the coordinates of each observation on principal component one versus principal component two. So if, for example, you wanted to do a t-test comparing snout vent or comparing PC1 scores of one species versus another, that's what you would use. And it's statistically independent of all the others. Now, we can look at these little graphs. So this shows you the loading for snout vent length on PC1. So this is the one for the first principal component. Which variable is most important on PC1? Well, duh. <laughs> snout vent length, OK? And in fact, what did we say? How many variables do we have? 1, 2, 13. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Let's see. What is our cutoff for being important? Open up a handy dandy super duper pocket rocket phone. Pull up my magical calculator. All right, I have 13, so I want the square root of 13. Square root of 13. Oh, that's not right. Square root of 13 equals 3.6, and I'm going to take the inverse of that. 1 divided by 3.6. 0 0.277, so call it 0.28. So anything larger than 0.28 is significant. First axis, snout vent length. Second axis, go up here, PC1, look at PC2. Second axis, what was it, 0.28? 
Hey, rear foot, digit four on the rear foot, and body weight or body width. Well, of course. What's important to a lizard? Thermoregulation, locomotor foraging strategy. Sit and wait versus active foraging. So the first two axes encapsulate everything about the natural history of these lizards in that very simple sort of analysis. Okay? So what it enables you to do, instead of thinking about this complicated 13-dimensional space, we can describe all of our lizards on the basis of these two axes, principal component one, which is not bad line, and principal component two, which is all about leg, rear leg and foot, and how wide you are. It's that easy. Okay? It's an incredibly, it's not a statistical test, but you can take those scores, right, those, those principal component scores and use those in a statistical test. All right? What a lot of people will do, what happens a lot in morphological sorts of data sets, so if you're working on jaws or whatever in your, in your um, cockroaches and in your, your wood roaches and your termites, what a lot of people do is say, oh, well, the first axis is always size, and the second axis is something else. That's not necessarily true. What a lot of people will do is they will take the log transformation of their data. So you can do that. You can log transform the data before you do these analyses. And that's going to take away some of that extreme size variation that we saw in the first axis. Right? But there are all sorts of things that you can do with this kind of analysis. It's incredibly convenient tool for biology, especially when you use, have really large, complicated data sets. What I did with this data set, I have a morphological data set, and for the same lizard species, I have an ecological data set. So for each lizard, I also have all this ecological data on where the animal was collected, the conditions under which it was, which it was collected. So I have one principal components analysis for the morphology and then a separate principal components analysis for the ecology. And then I do something called canonical correlation where I'm looking at the correlations between morphology and ecology. And it turns out it's like magic. You see, hey, animals with certain morphologies also have certain ecological requirements, which makes perfect sense biologically. But you're able to show it in a very clear, concise kind of way. All right. So your homework assignment for next week is to download program past, put it on your computer, and run the principal components analysis with the lizard morphology data set. You can do it with the entire data set, fine. I recommend that you just look at the North American or just look at the Australian or just look at the African, whatever you want, okay? To so download that data set, delete everything but one continent and then do the analysis on that, okay? And does, since you got a, I noticed you got a negative number, is that just saying that uh, the rear foot and the fourth digit on the rear foot? Yeah, so, so this means that as you go yeah. to the right on principal component two, the rear leg, the rear foot, gets longer uh, as the body gets skinnier. Okay. Okay. Sure, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because okay. the fast-moving skinny guys yeah. are narrow body. Mm -hmm. And the fat, wide-bodied guys have short feet. Okay. So, yeah. It, yeah. The, core, the direction does make sense. All right, guys. That's all she wrote for today. I will see you next week. Have a glorious weekend. Were your ecological data that you got on your lizards? Was it just like presence at absence of certain things, or was it like a? Oh no, I had I had perch height, perch temperature, um, uh, body temperature of the lizard. I had uh, plant cover at four different layers, uh, pre plant frequency at four different layers, importance values. It was just this huge. And then I had, in addition to that, I had uh, for this particular study site for each individual site where I was visiting I had 
uh, precipitation, cold season precipitation, warm season precipitation. It was just a slew of variables. I don't think my dad said it would be quite that big for my brother. It was going to be very large. And I had a lot of ecological components. It's the perfect way to deal with yes, it. That's what I was thinking. It, simplifi it simplifies the data set. It cleans it up. It normalizes it. And suddenly you have something which everything is statistically independent. And so many problems disappear when you do this. Yeah, so I think that would be a good first step for me yeah. when I get my data all cleaned up in Excel. Yeah. And then, yeah, because I figure I'd come talk to you here the next semester sometime about yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is, this is one of those things that, you know, when I first learned about principal components analysis, I mean, I had read papers with it and I never really comprehended it. But I was in a, in a class that was taught, co-taught, one of the guys that was co-teaching the class was an anthropologist, um, Henry Harpenbeck, who, it's a small fucking world, his PhD student at that time, I just edited a paper for his PhD student, and this guy was in this class with me when I was doing this, thing. just, you know, you never know. But anyway, he's the one who just in this very clear, concise way said, oh, it's really simple. Just forget about the math behind it. What it's doing is this. And you're just rotating the axes and shifting them over. And notice now everything is perpendicular. And you don't have to worry about all these correlations. They're all gone, right? So suddenly all this stuff that was skewed and weird before suddenly becomes all very normal and bell-shaped. <laughs> And then it seems like if you want to uh, then go back and uh, use the weight to guess the height, you just shift it back. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And we're, we're having an in-person class next week. Yeah, it'll, it'll be um, the, the um, seminar students have to, they'll spend the first hour doing their stuff. Right. Um, That's and, right. then, and then we'll, I will, hopefully I will have the, you know, enough of the R stuff simplified so that we can just do, you know, the autocorrelation stuff in the R. I, you can do the autocorrelation stuff here as well under um, model, uh, where is it? Time series, yeah, so ARMA, you know, Auto, auto regression moving moving averages. Yeah, see you guys next week. See ya.